Hello and welcome uh, to this session at Davos, uh, World Economic Forum 2024, where we're going to talk about calming green trade. Uh, at Davos, it is uh, uh, normal that we talk about trade issues, but outside of Davos, over the last few years, there's been a bubbling up of consternation that in a world that is in a climate crisis, a world that is uh, at war with nature, and a world where we're failing to deliver on the sustainable development uh, goals, that the conversation between climate and development and trade is perhaps not where it needs to be. And I think over the last 24 months, we've seen a shift from a conversation around um, uh, public money from the north being sent to the uh, global south or the global majority through climate finance or aid into a conversation around how trade and investment are going to be the vehicles of growth, uh, the vehicles for the war on poverty, the vehicles for uh, the uh, need for extraordinary amounts of investment in green infrastructure and so that the trade system as well as the investment system, the reform of the international financial institutions has to support uh, emerging markets and developing economies in their uh, climate goals as well as in their goals around prosperity. So uh, there are different views about how we get the climate world and the, uh, and the trade world to work better together. And there's extraordinary sort of work going on just down the road in Geneva at the World Trade Organization in UNCTAD. And it's at uh, WEF that the trade ministers meet and talk about climate. The first time that happened last year, and, and uh, you know, important processes there. And also here at the World Economic Forum, we see other initiatives being driven out of the private sector, where we can see that trade rules and, tr and policy around trade can have an extraordinary impact in speeding up the transition. So we have a first movers coalition of hard to abate sectors, so that the pieces of industry which are very very carbon intensive from shipping to aviation to trucking to steel and cement. Uh, and we can see that as you have companies all the way down the value chain making decisions about how they're going to decarbonize their business, that investment and trade rules can have a big impact in making that a global phenomenon. So I'm joined by an extraordinary panel. We're going to have a fast and furious <coughs> discussion on how to calm green trade. Um, and uh, I hope that you will uh, see this as a way to underpin what I think is beginning to be a very positive uh, conversation around the opportunities that trade will bring us, rather than the conversation about how trade may get in the way. So I'm joined by uh, a really diverse uh, group of panellists, uh, Espen Barth Eide, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Norway, uh, Juan Carlos Matthews, the uh, Minister of Foreign Trade and Tourism of Peru, and Peru holds the presidency of APEC this year, so a big job, uh, Siu Yuang, and who is the Founder and Chief Executive Officer of Factorial Energy in the USA, lives just down the road from me in Cambridge, and Sultan Ahmed uh, bin Salayam, who is the Group Chair Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of DP World UAE. <coughs> and of course, many of us <coughs> COP in November and saw DP World uh, everywhere. Uh, extraordinary uh, uh, presence. So, uh, my first question actually is going to come to you, CU. Uh, so, here you are, you're running a company that is involved in uh, new technologies, that breakthrough technologies for the energy sector. You're, you're based in the US. Uh, your supply chain is global, your customer base presumably is global. How do you think about uh, how trade can help you bring solutions for the climate crisis? Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree with you, Rachel. Trade it needs to be a booster for the economy and a booster for the innovations. And it is a very sophisticated system uh, across multinational collaboration. And I would say there's no other um, space in industry like EV that needs the support for trade. And we see that trade need to have the focus and the right priority, which is very important. We know that um, RA was, has been a really good booster for the EV industry in the US. And we wanted to also see there is a right focus on the battery and also on the battery supply chain that's been building up. Um, it's definitely like need to have a lot of more discussions about like what is the real priority and what is the real, real, real realistic target for us to, to reach um, in those markets. And I would say number two is really uh, to drive innovation, we, we need a lot of support on the government incentives. And the incentives not only to build the infrastructure, but also building the supply chain um, is going to be highly encouraged. Mm. 
And, <coughs> and I would say it's not only just the, the trade system, but also the entire manufacturing system is, is, is going to be very crucial um, for innovation. And, and the third, but not the least, is uh, really building and empowering the system. And because no government can be self-sufficient without the support uh, from their citizens. So the continued education to the people um, is very important. Like U.S. is very, very, um, <coughs> uh, it's a very open society, right? And, and I think the trade um, and climate change sometimes can be a, a topic, can be like politicized a lot more than what we expected. I know in many countries, climate change is a fact. <clears throat> and we know this is the hottest year in the history you know, in the world. And, and we know there's a melting um, in the Arctic, and there is also the receding in the, in the reef because of the climate change. Um, but I think in, 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 in many states, we wanted to make sure this is um, a, a bipartisan direction we wanted to move in. Um, because we don't want it to live in a world that we pass along to our generations and we're embarrassed by the fact we're leaving a world that's much worse than where we inherited before. So it's interesting. I mean, I, I live in the U.S. As, as well, and there's a tendency to sort of see uh, trade as uh, something that's... Uh, bad or that, that it has a negative connotation to it sometimes mm. in the domestic debate. Uh, and I think that's, that's quite puzzling. So uh, Rebecca Greenspan, who's the head of UNCTAD, always talks about the fact that we need more, better and greener trade. And, that, and mm. especially for emerging markets, developing economies, that's central. So I'm going to come to you, Sultan bin Salaam. I mean, the UAE is a small country with a global reach. DP World is a global end-to-end -end logistics provider. You're also part of the First Mover Coalition. Yes. So you're fundamentally integral to all of these supply chains being able to de uh, decarbonize. How do, how do you see, what, what do you see as the obstacles to that going faster and further? Uh, what would you like to see um, from, a, from a trade regime to support you to be able to do more? You know, when you attend the COP, you are really amazed of how bad we are doing. It's amazing. And uh, when you look at trade, trade is uh, very important for the world. Trade is carried 90% by water. There are challenges, of course, in using uh, fuel that's friendly. First of all, it's very expensive. Mm. And second, it's not available. And then if it's available, not everywhere you can find storage for it. Uh, so when you get somebody like Maersk who's building vessel to use alternative uh, energy or friendly energy, that could be three to five times the cost of the uh, fuel. So there is no way people will be encouraged unless, I hate to say this, and there's a tax so that on the fuel which is bad for the environment, people have to pay. So as long as everybody <coughs> is paying the same, people will go to the friendly one because it doesn't cost them. It would be, when everybody is doing that's fine. You see, today, electrifying, in our ports, for example, we, we electrified the engines uh, better than using the combustion engines. And contrary to what many people think, that uh, going green is expensive. Actually, it saves us a lot of money. In one instance, we almost saved whatever we invested in one year from electric bills, because we used to pay a higher cost on fuel and all that. And we are not subject to fluctuation of, of these costs. So in that sense, it's okay. When you come to solar, also it's working. But when you come to fuel for vessels, it's a different ballgame. It needs cooperation of everybody. Uh, we, have, uh, we are part of the uh, First Movers Coalition, definitely. We have a target of reaching zero by 2050. We have target to reach even some closer uh, targets before the end of uh, uh, you know this decade. But we definitely need government to be on board, involved, because the private sector can't do it alone. So it, it, it is interesting, right? So dual fuel ships are now being designed. Uh, that you, you're beginning to see the, 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 the supply of green ammonia and other green fuels, but they have to be in every port where, 
where the, the bulk of trade is yes. moving to and from. So it started, but we've got a lot further to go. Yeah, and, and you know, there are so many challenges. Look at the Panama Canal today. Yeah. With the lower water available, they, they are down by 30%. That means the vessel is going to now sail longer and compound the problem we have today. These are some of the challenges which we, which we have to deal with. Well, maybe that makes sense to come to you, Minister Either. So, Norway, uh, again, small country, big trading country, uh, big, uh, uh, long history in fossil fuels, which helped the country uh, evolve, and now uh, big commitments to going green. How do you think uh, about trade and the, and the partnerships that you need, both to decarbonise Norway, but also for Norway, Norway to help global supply chains decarbonise? Thank you. Exactly. That's, that's exactly the question. I just want to say we just had a very successful COP in, uh, in the UAE, in uh, Dubai, and next month there's a ministerial mini yeah. uh, meeting of uh, WTO in uh, Abu Dhabi. So let's take the spirit of Dubai to Abu Dhabi and see if we can have any equally successful uh, trade ministers uh, or, or the WTO ministers meeting. But, but, but this is really a crucial issue. I, I believe very much in the goal of uh, uh, more, better and greener trade. Uh, it, it is very much about issues like uh, transport and production uh, because uh, trade is good trade helps to you know trade has helped to reduce difference between countries it gives brings more people into the modern economy uh, but it has potentially it has downsides I mean it means that you build the product slightly cheaper in Asia and you ship it to Europe uh, with a lot of transport emissions and so on so you need also to look at those issues and 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 we we have you know the key issue to much of this is of course carbon pricing because if we actually had the system of a global carbon price uh, we would not need to introduce for instance CBAMs uh, you know mm -hmm. carbon border adjustment mechanisms which are perfectly necessary uh, for those regions that are trying to step up and actually price emissions, but you can't then import through the back door the same type of emissions that you have prohibited at the home. But of course, it also has some, uh, <coughs> it, it does generate conflict because parts of the developing world are wondering if this, is this really climate policy or is this actually a way to keep us out? And, and all of this coincides with the geopolitical trend where I started going to Davos 21 years ago and it was the heyday of globalization. China just uh, joined the World uh, Trade Organization. Uh, the sense was the world was opening up. It was, economy was now free of uh, geopolitical limitations. Now it's all about home, home sourcing, home shoring, friend shoring, plurilateral agreements, you know, regional agreements. So this heyday of globalization is over. It's not coming back in the old version. I think if it's going to come back, it has to be by merging the sort of the paramount issue of climate to deal with how we produce, how we transport, how we relate to energy, but also by doing that in a way that can open up to the whole world. So we're not ending up, you know, in our own little blocks. And it's not easily done, but, it, but in order to contribute to that, we need to address exactly this issue. How do we continue to believe in the mutual value of an open rules-based trade system while also making sure it's compatible with what we just agreed on in, uh, in Dubai, which is to accelerate the transition away from fossil fuels and to start build not only the sources of renewable and clean energy, but also the grids, the distribution and the actual use of that. How can all this be brought together? And it's not being brought together by itself. And if we, we live in a trade policy world and a climate policy world, it's not going to happen. So connecting these worlds is very, very important. So there have also been uh, uh, sessions here, I think it's the only place that this happens, where the sort of critical minerals and mining mm -hmm. community sit down with the renewable energy community. I mean, we were both in sessions because that's, you know, uh, 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 on the critical path to achieving. And of course, it opens up all kinds of questions for new markets and basically keeping uh, revenue and keeping... Um, uh, wealth in the countries that have uh, extraordinary amounts of renewable energy and extraordinary amounts of minerals and metals, and that's the emerging markets and developing economies. So this this world is starting to look quite quite different. But then let's let's come to Peru, right? A vulnerable country to climate change. 
the World Bank has estimated that actually you could grow your economy uh, by adapting and, and mitigating climate change effectively. But we're coming out of the warmest year uh, ever, um, which the insurance industry has calculated probably took about 0.6% of GDP uh, away out of the global economy. So th this is difficult to manage. You will need to adapt. Adaptation for Peru is very important uh, because of your vulnerability. How do you see the trade or a, a, a green trade um, regime as being supportive to Peru's prosperity? Let's see. Um, we have the clear idea that, that um, sustainable trade and sustainable growth are no longer an option, are just a condition for participating in the market. No? Uh, some years ago, if we are talking about the 80s, uh, the, the main barrier was uh, the import taxes, not the tariffs. In our case, it was about 100% in, as an average. You know? now, nowadays, it's about 2%. So it is not so important. In the, in the next years, uh, uh, the, the barriers were related to quality standards. And nowadays, one of the main issues is related to sustainability. And uh, we, for example, as Peru, are a very, very open economy. We, are, we have 22 free trade agreements. <clears throat> We are open in, in, in South America, Peru, Mexico, and, and, and Chile are the most open economies. But in most of the cases, we are incorporating in the negotiation <clears throat> issues related to the climate change and sustainability. For example, in the case of the, the free trade that we have with the European Union, with the UK, with Korea, and we are negotiating also a modernization of the free trade agreement that we have since 2010 with China, incorporating uh, digital issues and incorporating green economy and customs and some other points. Uh, and uh, at the same time, we are negotiating with Hong Kong, with India, with Indonesia, and in all the cases, the modern free trade agreements incorporate these issues. No? So it is a must. In the, in, in the business right now, all of them are demand driven and it is becoming a condition. So it, it doesn't matter if we agree or not, we have to do it and it is good for everybody and we are working on that. No? So let's talk about how we can build this collaboration, right? It, it, so, that, so that the trade regime is supportive of our climate goals as, mm -hmm. as, as all countries have agreed. Maybe come straight back to you because you're hosting APEC. So how do you bring this vision or this reality into the APEC discussions this year? Yes, uh, APEC is not a scenario for negotiations, but it's a scenario for cooperation. But uh, economies are aligned with this idea. Uh, of the total of 21 economies, we have three trade agreements with 14 of them, and we are negotiating with two more and in all the cases incorporating these issues. It is very important because in terms of exports, about 60% of our total exports are referred to the mineral products. And uh, in Peru, we have 219 uh, social conflicts all over the country, most of them referring to the mining sector and in almost all the cases related to the environment. So it is, it is crucial to have this coordination uh, between the government, the private investor, and the community. So, and we have just had uh, two hours ago a meeting with one of the best examples of, uh, of the things uh, done in the correct way, no? Queyabeco is a very important project, and we have met with the investors, and they are a kind of exceptions. They have done the things in the correct way, organizing everything with the participation of the government and the community, and understanding the gaps in the region, because it has no sense that you have very important investment in some areas, and at the same time, they are remaining as the poorest in the country and with a lot of problems of, or related to environment and, and some other issues such as labor. No? So it's a key factor, and we are working on that, and we have now good examples to show. No? So I think that this is a really good example because when you've got these massive investments coming into traditionally low income and, and, and sometimes uh, marginalized communities, then that brings with it all kinds of um, other uh, social issues and environmental issues. And so, you know, we, this conversation around how trade can be made to be a positive 
rather than seen as uh, as a negative. I think it's really important. But perhaps coming coming to the private sector on the panel, what what do you need? If, what collaboration would you like to see internationally between governments and you know the the conversation between the public sector and the private sector in order to build a, a greener trade system that's supportive of both prosperity goals and climate goals. Yeah, to the point mentioned earlier about the, 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 the areas with the conflicts, I would say that's very important um, for us and we wanted to make sure the supply chain is compliant. Mm -hmm. This is where yes. the trade can potentially help, is to build a more compliant and also transparent supply mm -hmm. chain. Something like in Europe has been implemented um, in the horizon is a battery passport, for example. And in many other countries in the US, like we don't have it, right? Something like that, build, building more transparency among different countries and, and encourage the collaboration and have a very clear mandate is gonna be, uh, first of all, very important. And number two is like investing in the, in the right space and investing in innovation. Because a lot of this um, tension is coming from the challenge in the cost, the challenge in the poverty, right? Yes. Building education into certain communities and, and bringing awareness to education, engineering. Because a lot of conflicts and, and a lot of this uh, challenge in mining, mm -hmm. it, it comes in because of the pollution and the, the damage to the people's life. If we can make it more efficient and bring more many more more in, innovation into those process, that's going to be encouraging a lot of this um, happening. And the same thing for building batteries and building electric vehicles. And if you can have a higher efficiency in a battery um, and with a lower cost, right, that can address a lot of the concerns on climate change and, and sustainability already. Can I come to you, uh, 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 because you, you hosted COP28, as we've already referred to, uh, that was the first COP to have a trade uh, nice. pavilion, right? it was, which is remarkable. It, it was quite remarkable to think that that was the first time. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, as uh, Minister Ada already said, you're, you're hosting uh, the trade ministers meeting next month. Where do you, th I mean, trade and climate, trade and, I mean, this is greening trade, this is a big agenda. Where do you think governments should focus and prioritise? What would, <laughs> what would give us the biggest bang for a buck uh, right now. Yeah. There are many uh, other contributors to uh, carbon emissions. Uh, one of them is delays, for example, with customs. When, when they don't speak the same language, delays, you see truck sitting for 10 hours working instead of going. So that is a problem. Another one is protectionism. When you have protectionism policies, uh, there are certain regulations that prevent trade, even though these are non-tariff barriers, uh, are happening. So the world has to work together <coughs> to, to, to really uh, remove that. Today, one of the largest uh, producers of uh, solar panels in China, but with this kind of uh, geopolitical issues, it will impact the ability of people to get the best and uh, the most efficient from China. Uh, in, in with us as a company, we work uh, to reduce wherever we come. For example, a good example is we established a logistic park in Rwanda. And the main port for Central Africa uh, is there. But they get their cargo from Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, or Mombasa in Kenya. It used to take two weeks and a cost of between five to $7,000. When we put this and organize the trade, it only takes 48 hours. So imagine how much fuel you saved just by organizing it and having proper customs in both sides. And the cost <coughs> reduced from 7,000 to 2,800 just by organizing. The fact, you know, in, in, uh, the main product in Rwanda, for example, is tea and coffee. <coughs> and the, 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 the farmer produce 30% more for waste in case the product gets wasted. We established a coal, a coal store, and we told the farmers, produce what you need, no access. And we pick up the cargo from the farmers with a special container, and now they don't need to overproduce. That's again, there are a lot of things we can do as private sector when we, when we are, and it's reduced. In Brazil, uh, Brazil is uh, one of the first countries to use biofuel. And now we're working with the government to use it in the port 
to reduce uh, the emissions. So, th so this is a beautiful example of trade and logistics working to decarbonise and bring uh, greater wealth to a, to a small farmer because they've got prediction of, you know, a cool supply chain, etc. So, I think these are the, these are the, these are the these are the stories which uh, which get overlooked. I, I, so I think that's wonderful. So, in the industrialised world, um, a return to industrial policy, green barriers coming up or perceived to be so. Great fear in the emerging markets developing economies that somehow in, in, the, in a return to industrial policy that they will be uh, on the outside again, right? So, concern around CBAM, concern around some of the aspects of the Inflation Reduction Act. As a foreign minister in uh, the part of the world that uh, caused the climate crisis, what kind of collaboration do you think could have the greatest impact and how, how do you see this? No, and this is an incredibly important question uh, uh, and I agree with the description. There, there are reasons why we've seen the return of industrial policy and one of them is that you know, when tomorrow looks more or less like today, you can let the market fix things. But when you have to go through systemic changes where you have to deal with both the chicken and the egg, I mean, if you want to do hydrogen green or blue hydrogen or clean hydrogen transport, you need to produce the hydrogen, you need to distribute it to the port and to the next port, and you have to have the ships. So you can't just fix one part of it. It's a, it's a, it's a big thing. And, and that requires industrial policy and more active state intervention. Uh, and if, as I said, if you, if you you, if we in our part of the world want to put the price on the externality, which is the heating up of the planet, it, it sim we simply have to deal with the issue that we can't allow other countries not to do so. But that creates trade tension, which are true, and we, need, we who do this need to recognize understand why. And I don't think the answer is not to do it. The answer is to do it in such a way that is inclusive and open and welcoming emerging markets. I mean, there is a major potential to reap the benefits of it, of countries who have so least, the least developed countries who haven't actually been through any kind of energy revolution yet can go straight into renewables and, and then you know, pick up their own natural resources, don't sell them as resources, but use cheap energy and probably cheap labor to develop products, which you can then export and you, 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 you sell the goods and the services more than just the raw materials. That, that's actually a great potential with a number of African countries, I think also in Latin America. This is a growing discourse that maybe we should stop thinking about just you know, selling the commodity, but actually doing something with it. So, and we should support that. So we should say that, yes, we need to put the price of carbon, but some of that money will actually be used to help you guys in the South to, uh, if you want to, to develop to jet peace and, and other partnerships to actually make sure you're part of this new world. And I have to say again that, you know, if we, if, if, if we agreed on a common pricing of the externalities, you know, uh, carbon emissions and nature loss, uh, we could have a free trade system that would still work quite on its own as long as this was a genuine pricing. It's not going to happen tomorrow, uh, but there are some initiatives out there to try to push that. And the, the, the best outcome of the CBAM story is that you don't actually need to introduce it because you're, you have inspired other countries mm -hmm. to, to, to put the price at home, which also gives government revenue, which many development countries could do well with. So, it was. Uh, I'm going to open it up for questions. We've got a few minutes from the audience, um, but it, one of the I thought one of the most important moments or photographs, you know, at uh, at COP was actually uh, the Director General of WTO sitting with the Managing Director of the IMF, President of the World Bank, and the head of the OECD, sort of saying we're actually going to start working together again at the political level on carbon pricing. Uh, long overdue and, and very important. Um, questions from the audience. Don't be shy. Professor Esty. Hi, I'm Dan Esty, a professor at Yale, although um, only recently returned after two years in Geneva on secondment to the World Trade Organization. And I, I want to ask uh, perhaps all of you, but uh, particularly those with uh, European connections, mm -hmm. um, is the push for the carbon border adjustment mechanism helping or hurting the effort to drive sustainability forward through the trade mechanism. And here's what I worry about. Um, I think the CBAM could be arguably said to be conceptually correct 
You don't want companies getting competitive advantage in traded goods by underperforming against environmental requirements. On the other hand, and I would argue, by the way, from a policy point of view, it may be essential, and yet it seems structurally flawed. Wouldn't it make sense to fix the sort of unilateralism that uh, our colleague from uh, Dubai World Ports, uh, Dubai Ports uh, is suggesting is out there? And I think the minister from uh, Peru, the same thing. There's a fear that this is emerging as green protectionism. Mm. And I think that's a devastating uh, conclusion. And I wonder why Europe hasn't pulled back and said, let's rethink and not make this so unilateral. Find common ways to measure the greenhouse gases. Agree upon a global social cost of carbon, which you've said you wanted yourself. And I, I wonder whether uh, there shouldn't be acknowledgement of different approaches to climate change so that we're crediting at the border not just explicit carbon pricing, but a broader array of efforts. Uh, and fundamentally, I wonder whether there shouldn't be a greater commitment to equity uh, in the European Union framework in a way that would ensure those developing countries feel s appropriately taken care of. Yep, Minister. Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, you laid it out very correctly. It, it, on, on the one hand, it is politically necessary and it will happen. It has been decided. And I think it's very difficult for uh, European governments uh, to explain to, you know, their businesses and, and workers that we will have a carbon price of 100 euros, probably growing to 200 euros within not so many years. But you know, it does. But but if but if we import the same product from somewhere in Asia without the carbon price, you know, they will they will compete you out. So that that's politically impossible. So that's a real it's a real thing, and it's not going to go away. However, uh, it also has all the consequences you described, Professor. That's also correct. Uh, uh, no, I think it's important to design it. And I know that uh, Director General Ngozi has also said that look at how you design uh, CBAM. It has to be very clear that if you actually say, here's the car I paid in my home country, my country just introduced this price, or I'm part of some other scheme, then you're exempt, right? Well, this, this would be the counter argument to, be, to being protectionism, is that you can fix it at home. And we are seeing that some countries are now looking at uh, exploring a, a, a carbon price system at home, it, precisely because it's much smarter to take mm -hmm. the money for your government than to see another government in Europe taking the money when you export your products. So, so and, and, and Franz Timmermans, who is one of the you know, coiners of this idea, has said that he, he, would not, he would be happy if we didn't actually have to introduce it because it triggered sort of a global move. But, so then you could ask, why, would, why aren't you just waiting? Well, because we've been waiting too long, and, and, and the, the, the space for more emissions in the atmosphere is so limited that you can't wait for a perfect world because it's not coming around the corner. But it is a very important conversation to be had, and in the meantime, let's recognize it's the second best to a global carbon price, and we in the North, uh, who do this should compensate and, and take active measures to make sure that those affected <coughs> negatively by it can be brought into it. But there's also a message to emerging economies in this. It's don't make sure you're not locking in your economy in the fossil world, which the Western world is leaving behind. Because you will believe here we have cheap products, we have relatively cheap labor, we have an abundance of resources, and still we will not get into the market. So go for the new rather than the old. And at least my government is very ready to be, you know, to be with them in, in developing this tech transfer and so on to, to make this happen. But it's a real problem, and it's, I, I did not take it away, because the professor's question remains <coughs> relevant yeah. for all of us. Yeah. Just a, a very short point to underline, uh, in addition to what has been mentioned. No? Uh, as I mentioned when I was talking about the mining sector in Peru, in the case of these issues such as deforestation, illegal fishery, uh, energy transition, food uh, security as a chain, etc. the solution should be built with the participation of all these stakeholders, no? because we are in favor of, for example, the, 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 the proposal of the European Union with, in terms of deforestation, but not in terms of the terms uh, of how long it is going to take. So it is very important to be in touch with all the stakeholders to establish the real solution. No? So just a, a, a small but very, I think, very important point. 
Well, we're out of time, um, uh, unfortunately. You can see that uh, to build... Um, if we're going to achieve the objectives that we set for ourselves as an international community, we're going to uh, decarbonise. We are not going to leave people behind. We're going to give people a chance at prosperity by building a cleaner, greener world. Then we need a trading system that will take us all there, which means that uh, unilateralism is going to have a limited impact and a, a, a new era of collaboration and cooperation is going to be fundamental at a time when geopolitical tensions are on the rise. So we need uh, leaders in the private sector, leaders in government, leaders in, uh, uh, from all, uh, all, all parts of the world, and we're going to need really um, brave uh, leadership uh, in the international uh, organisations that have been the system for the past 80 years and need to reform their systems to be relevant for the next 80. Um, there is much to do. Uh, the WEF is doing a lot on different aspects of this. Thank you for joining us wherever you are in the world. Thank you for those of you in the room, and please thank the panel.